Hello everybody, welcome. In this video we will be talking about morphological analysis or the process that you use to figure out a problem like this, looking at a data set from a language that you may know nothing about and you have to match translations with their forms represented in the language that you are analyzing. So before we go any further, if you have not already, not already done so, I would recommend that you look at part one on the morphology video that is on my channel because it gives you useful information on first what a morpheme is as well as information on how to determine morphemes in a language. So all of the examples were from English in that video, but it is a useful toolkit for when you are looking at another language. So let's walk you through this process. Um, incidentally, this exercise is very similar to a puzzle called a cryptoquip. Cryptoquips often appear in newspapers, and it's basically where one letter represents another letter throughout the puzzle, and it usually is some sort of joke or silly pun, but that kind of process in solving a cryptoquip is very similar to the process that you use to solve a morphological analysis problem. So. Solving cryptoquip puzzles is great practice for morphological analysis, and I guess vice versa. All right, so just another reminder before we get uh, started here is uh, if you're looking at a language and you may know some of that language, you want to try to forget that information and just treat the data that you see before you as the whole language itself. Of course, this is not the entirety of Michoacan Aztec. After all, we're only looking at 10 forms here with just a few uh, morphemes that we have to account for. House, dog, cornfield, plural markers, my, your, and his. That's it. Um, so there are many more forms in this language, but we don't need to know any of that. We need to just look at this problem as if it is its own self-contained universe. So uh, we've got our data set up top, and then we're going to essentially be answering questions in three parts here. Part one, where we have meanings in English that we need to account for in this language, Michoacan Aztec. In part two, uh, that will require us to have done part one. Once we've done part one, we could do this question where we have to figure out the English translation for the phrase y pelo. And then we do the exact opposite activity for part three, where we take a phrase in English, like his cornfields, and we translate it into this language. So just a word about the language itself. Uh, this is Michoacan Aztec, which is a dialect of Aztec, or Nahuatl, as it is often known. And this is a Udo-Aztecan language that is spoken in Mexico. Um, a lot of people think of Aztec as just a dead language, uh, but Michoacan Aztec actually has a few thousand speakers in Mexico. All right, so let's dive in here. Now, the best place to start when you were looking at a morphological analysis problem for a language that you know nothing about is to look at forms that are very similar. And maybe the best place to start is actually by looking at their glosses or their translations in English. So if we look at A and B, for example, we can see that the translations are very similar. For A, we have my house, and that's no cali, and we need to kind of break that down and figure out what part means my, what part means house. Uh, and then we could look at B, which is the same, except for one thing. We've got this added plural marker at the end that we will need to account for. So this is a good place to start because it's kind of similar to this notion of a minimal pair in a language. And I talk about a minimal pair in part two of the morphological, of, of morphology that I uploaded, even though minimal pairs have a lot more to do uh, with phonology. But anyway, um, getting back to A and B here, if you see that the gloss is my house for A and that the gloss for B is my houses, there's only one category of difference here. They both have this meaning of my, they both have a meaning of house, but this one has an added plural marker. So what that means is any difference that you see reflected in the Mishawakan Aztec forms for A and B, the difference will be uh, what's accounting for the plural marker. So notice that no kali is present in both of these forms for A and B, but mes is extra. So mes then must mean the plural marker in this language. And we can then go ahead and write that down here being careful to put this enclosed in brackets to signify that this is the uh, international phonetic alphabet since all of these are enclosed 
in brackets. So it's not how it's just written in terms of the orthography or writing system of that language. It may not even have one. Uh, this is instead how you actually pronounce the form in that language. So we want to be consistent and then write mes as the form that indicates the plural marker. And then we could sort of do a brief double check here by looking at other forms where mes appears and see if plurality is also represented in the gloss. And sure enough, the only other time when we see mes pop up is the only other time when we see the plural marker represented in English. So we've nicely just verified that mes in uh, Michoacan Aztec must represent the plural marker, kind of through a process of deduction. So we've still got several other forms to account for, and we can actually uh, go to C and D. That's a nice place to kind of keep going. So look at this one. It's your house versus his house. So again, we just look back at the forms represented in C and D, and whatever is different, that's going to represent the possessive pronoun. So this one means mokali, this one means ikali. If this means your house and this means his house, well, then we could be pretty sure that mo must represent your and that e must represent his. So we can go ahead and write these in here. So right next to his, we'll write the e. And of course, this is a lowercase i, but we are using the international phonetic alphabet here. And this symbol represents the sound e. Uh, and then going back to no, or sorry, we're actually doing mo. Uh, mo must mean your. All right, so we're moving along here, and um, we could also kind of double check our work here because we could look at other places where this morpheme makes an appearance or where this translation makes an appearance. So we can look at other translations in English and we would expect that mo should appear. And we've got mo kali here. That was the basis for our proposing that mo means your. Uh, but it also appears here, your cornfield. And sure enough, there's mo. So that seems to check out just fine. And we can do the same thing with his for his house. We've got the e. So that's our basis for making this claim that E represents his. All right, and then do we see his? Yeah, there's his right there. And sure enough, there's E at the beginning. So we've got enough evidence here to keep these uh, as we've written them. So now it just kind of gets easier. The more morphemes you figure out, the easier it is to determine the meanings of the other ones. So if we go to look at, say, E and F, that's another great place to compare forms because my dog compared with your dog, very similar here. So um, we've already determined that your in this language is represented by the morpheme mo in uh, Michoacan Aztec. So sure enough, mo makes an appearance there. If we know that means your, well, then everything after it, that must mean dog. So pelo may mean hair in Spanish, but in this language, Michoacan Aztec, it means dog. All right, uh, and then if we go back to E here, we've determined that pelo means dog. So what comes before that? We've got no. Well, that must, through a process of elimination, represent the meaning for my. And now we've got two more morphemes that we have to account for, house and cornfield. So if we go back to... I guess C and D will allow us to answer these questions. So we've already determined that your in this language is mo, and that e in this language means his. So we can reliably say that kali means house. And the last one that we need to figure out here is how to say cornfield. And cornfield is only represented in letters H, I, and J. Again, we've already determined that E means his, so if this gloss is his cornfield, we can isolate the E and determine that everything that comes after it, that must mean the form for cornfield. 
And we can do a little test here by looking at H, I, and J, and just to make sure that if Quachmili does mean cornfield, E should mean his, no should mean my, which it does, and mo should mean your. So once we've done the first part here, uh, this is sort of the hardest part of this whole process because we need to determine what each morpheme represents in Michoacan Aztec. We've already done that. Now before we can move to part two, it's really useful to determine the order of elements in this language. And it's actually very sim uh, similar to the order of elements in English. So in English, if we want to say my dogs, well first, you know, you've got, uh, you've got my, so that possessive pronoun comes first. It precedes the noun, dog. And then you have a plural marker, z, which comes after it. That order is the exact same, just by coincidence, in Michoacan Aztec. So, if we've got e pelo here, uh, do you have any guesses as to what that actually means in English? So, e pelo is the form in Michoacan Aztec. What does it mean in English? See if you can pause your video, take a moment, and try to determine what that means in English. All right, so if you've looked at this, you see that the E means his, and we know that uh, the possessive pronoun always comes first in this language, so we can say that already this means his, and we also know that pelo means dog in this language, and that that noun always comes second. So, e pelo must mean his dog in Michoacan Aztec. Now, part three is the exact opposite activity where you now have a phrase in English, his cornfields, and you have to determine how to say it in Michoacan Aztec. Don't panic, you may not speak the language, but that's all right, you've got all the information here to allow you to determine the answer. So his, once again, we've already determined, well, that must mean E, and kind of going back to our order here, which says that uh, you basically just get the possessive pronoun, and then you get the noun, and then after that, you get the plural marker. So if we follow that order, then we can write in brackets, his cornfields must be E, any guesses what comes next? We've got cornfields, so that's and then we have to account for that plural marker because S denotes plural in English, but it's not that way in Michoacan. The plural marker is mes. So we put mes at the very end, and that is how we say his cornfields in Michoacan Aztec. Iquachmili mes. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but that's okay. We're sort of just looking at this in terms of data on a page. All right, so that, in uh, a very brief way, is how you go about doing morphological analysis. So just as a brief recap here, when you're looking at the data, don't panic. You may not know anything about the language that you're analyzing, but you will be able to do it. You treat the data as if it's its own self-contained universe, and it's really useful to have a highlighter or several colored pencils and you could uh, either highlight each morpheme, or you can just use one pen and underline it for one morpheme, and use a squiggly underline for another morpheme. You could circle one morpheme to represent yet another one. This isn't required, but it's a useful way, especially if you're just starting out, to help you to visually organize information and to distinguish visually one morpheme from another. All right, uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope you found this video useful. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you have a great day. Take care.